think for anybody today that today is Palm Sunday. We've sung a whole lot of songs with the word Hosanna in it. We've talked about, uh, the, already heard a passage read from Jason about Jesus riding into town on the back of a donkey. It's not unusual on a Sunday like this for us to give away uh, at the conclusion of the sermon um, some of the, the, the palms from a palm tree. And uh, it's, you know, why, why do people do that in a state like Minnesota where palm trees don't really grow? And by the time the palm frauds get here, they look pretty... Um, pretty sick, actually. Um, What is it that uh, makes us do that? Well, it all goes back to that first Palm Sunday. In John 12, 12 and 13, we read, the next day, the large crowd that had come to feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. When those words were said, it had been an incredible time for the followers of Jesus. Not long before those words were said, Jesus had spoken some words to a dead man, a a friend of his, a man named Lazarus, who had been dead long enough that he was already in the tomb. He was in his ceremonial wrappings. He had a, a body that was decaying for a few days. And in a miracle that stirred the people, even the dead were brought back to life by Jesus. As we enter the holiest week of the Christian calendar, I want to suggest to you that the reason that we celebrate Jesus is because he has the power to raise spiritually dead people to life. We uh, left the book of Genesis last week when our common ancestors, ancestors that every one of us share, Adam and Eve, were at their lowest. They had just experienced the fall. And like Palm Sunday, the leaves of a tree play a role in their story. The very first mention of a leaf in the Bible is a fig leaf. There are actually some fig leaves that are mentioned in Genesis 3-7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. That's where we left last week. I put some pictures of some fig trees, uh, fig leaves on the screen today. There's some here. There's another slide right after this that, that gives you another close-up of some fig leaves. And, um, you know, these fig leaves, I don't know about you, but I don't think they make for a real great fashion statement. I kind of picture Adam and Eve sitting, and I'm not a real big fan of, of leaves in the fall. My worship team's not going to be a fan of me after throwing these on stage today. But, you know, I picture Adam and Eve, they have sinned in the garden. Now, there was no death up until this point before sin came into the world. So I don't know that if they sinned, all of a sudden leaves, you know, started falling off of trees. They probably went to the fig tree, picked live leaves off of that fig tree. But they take these leaves and in their desperation and in their guilt and in their despair, they begin to recognize that they are physically naked. They're embarrassed by that. I think they're probably more embarrassed by their spiritual nakedness. But as a response to their physical nakedness, they begin to make the first clothes out of some leaves that look like that. Not a great fashion statement in any generation. And I gotta, I gotta believe that they looked pitiful in those leaves. I gotta believe that they were absolutely miserable painfully, again, aware of their nakedness, painfully ashamed. These were people who not only were ashamed, but were dying. They were people who Jesus had said, if you, if you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And now they're on their way to experiencing something that they would not have experienced had they not partaken of that tree. So they were ashamed, they were dying, they were deceived, they were rebellious, they were absolutely guilty, and they were fearful. And all of those were feelings they had never experienced. This was all new. This wasn't their normal. This was the result of the fall. My guess would be that most of us here cannot remember the first time we sinned. I'm sure for me it was as a young child, and I have no idea what it was. But I know this, there are some sins in my life that I do remember. There are some sins in my life that even after all these years, I can remember the feelings of guilt. I can remember the feelings of despair. I can remember the feelings of shame that came 
with that sin. I remember when I was a teenager, we had this store called the Little Store that was right across the street from our house. And one of the things that the little store did was rented videos, okay? This is back when they had VHS video cassettes that you would rent. And um, it became a source of temptation for me. There was a movie that I knew that I shouldn't rent, but all my friends were watching it, and all of them said how great the movie was. And I knew that it had all sorts of stuff in it that was going to be not only a temptation for me, but was going to lead me into sin. And I didn't care. I wanted to watch the movie. And so without my parents' knowledge, I walked across the street. I saw Mike, the owner of the store, and I was a little bit embarrassed because I'd known Mike since I was a little boy, and I knew Mike knew everything that was in that movie, but I didn't care. I wanted to watch that film. And so I rented the movie from Mike, kind of a little bit of shame entering me as I rented that movie. I stuffed it in my shirt, didn't want anybody to see me on my, uh, on my walk back up to the house. I get to the house, and we had a TV downstairs. Not a real smart idea, probably, because it, it was a basement where I had a bedroom, and nobody else in the room uh, in the house did. And everybody was gone, and I put that videotape in the house. And every time I heard a creak upstairs, I was scared that I was going to get caught. And uh, I watched part of the movie. I didn't even watch the whole movie. I watched part of the movie, felt such shame. I hid the videotape in my dresser drawer, and then I forgot to return it. And about a week later, my mother gets a phone call from the owner of the little store. Isn't that how it always happens? Your sins will find you out, okay? And I don't know if the owner ever told my mom what the videotape was. I think he kind of liked his little secret business and liked the fact that he could rent to teenage boys without their parents knowing. So I don't know if he told my mom what film was late, but he just said, your son Brian rented a, a video from us and it's overdue. Will you remind him to return the video? And so my mother came downstairs and said, Brian, I just got a call from the little store. You've got a videotape that is due. And, you know, she never asked you what the movie was because she trusted me so much. Or maybe she did know what it was and knew that my own guilty conscience was going to get the best of me. And I, uh, when my mom wasn't around, got the video again, stuffed it in my shirt, went down the, the uh, street, brought it back to the little store. But the guilt that I felt that day was huge. But maybe you've had an experience like that. That's what sin does. Sin brings with it this guilt, this desire to hide what we've done from others. And it stems from the very first sin. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, Adam and Eve, who have had and experienced paradise, were now hiding. One author writes, In an instant, the original couple passed from life to death, from sinlessness to sin, from harmony to alienation, from trust to distrust, from ease to dis-ease. It did not take a day. It happened in a millisecond. And some of you are well aware of the fact that sometimes sin happens in a millisecond, doesn't it? And you might say, well, yeah, the, the actual sin happens in a millisecond, but maybe there's some compromises along the way that leads to that millisecond decision. So what does verse 8 say? And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. For their entire lives, and we don't know, Scripture doesn't tell us how long that life had been up to this point, Adam and Eve had experienced the fellowship of God in the garden. Kent Hughes writes, in the garden... He says the garden was his earthly palace, his garden temple. What the couple heard was the rustle of God's step. It was the sacred sound that they had heard before and that had filled them with joy, but now brought such dread. And I would venture to say that every one of us have had an experience in our life where we could say that if I heard the rustle of God after that experience, I'd be filled with dread too. If I knew that the presence of God was right there with me in that moment, I'd be shaken. Some of you would say, if I knew that God would be in my garden today as I clear out some of the dead leaves from the fall, I'd be filled with dread. Some of you would say, I'm sitting here at Woodbury Community Church 
And if God were to walk into the sanctuary in the flesh today of this church, I'd want to hide. Sometimes we allow the shame of our sin to cause us to seek asylum from God instead of refuge in God. I want to say that again. Sometimes we allow the shame of sin to cause us to seek asylum, to get away from God instead of seeking refuge in him. While Adam and Eve hid in their ridiculous fig leaf costumes, God walked in the garden toward the original sinners. Adam and Eve couldn't hide from God. And neither can you, and neither can I. It's a fact that made King David, I think, kind of shake as he wrote these words in Psalm 139. I can never be lost to your spirit. I can never get away from my God. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the place of the dead, you are there. If I ride the morning winds to the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me. Your strength will support me. If I hide in the darkness, the night becomes light around me. For even darkness cannot hide from God. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are both alike to you. You know what's amazing? We think that our sin makes us so ugly to God that he could not possibly want anything to do with us. And what I want to say to you this morning is if that's the lie you believe, it is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Your sin is ugly. You can agree with that. God can agree with that. But you're not. You are somebody that God pursued. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is a God who is passionate about us. But you know what one of Satan's tools is? He wants to shame you. He wants to make you feel so guilty. He wants to make you feel like somebody who could never, ever experience the grace of God. Dr. Les Parrott says, shame is a spinoff from guilt. We may feel guilty for what we did, but we feel ashamed of who we are. And that is what I was, think was going on in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. They had moved from innocence to guilt, and in their guilt had become ashamed of who they were. Sin creates in us the inability to see ourselves through the lens of God. Every human being who has ever lived has dealt with shame and guilt. And that may be the spot you find yourself in this morning, which is ironic, isn't it? Maybe some of you are here today and you find yourself in a spot of shame and you find yourself in a spot where you're wanting to hide from God and yet you're in a church. And you're in a church where today we have sung, Hosanna, Hosanna. You know what the word Hosanna means? Save us. So the people shouted in Israel as Jesus rode through the streets on the donkey. Save us. We need Christ to save us. And it's no mistake that you're in this church today because it is only he who is worthy of our worship who can do that. On the first Palm Sunday, the streets were filled with people who wanted a savior from the tyranny of Rome. But what they needed was a savior from the tyranny of sin. In Luke 19, while on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus would ride, where he would ride into the streets of a donkey on Palm Sunday. At the beginning of that chapter, Jesus has not yet arrived in Jerusalem. He is in Jericho, and he meets a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and an all-around bad guy. He was kind of like the organized crime guy of the first century. Zacchaeus was a sinner. He didn't even hide it. Everyone in Jericho knew that Zacchaeus and his cronies, who were tax collectors like him, were people who profited from the exploitation of the citizens of Israel. He was a short man, the Bible tells us. And if you grew up in Sunday school, maybe you sang the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Okay, a tiny man. He couldn't see Jesus over the crowds of people in front of him. So he climbs up into a sycamore tree because the Lord he wanted to see, right, is what the song says. Climbs up into a sycamore tree to get a better view of Jesus, this radical rabbi, this prophet that some called him, this healer, this miracle worker who's coming into Jericho. You know what Jesus does with this despicable man? He looks up into the sycamore tree 
And if you listen to the song, Zacchaeus, you come down from there, for I'm coming to your house today, right? He tells him to come down, because I'm going to dine with you in your house, Zacchaeus, today. One of those things that ticked the religious leaders and the spiritual people of the day off. Why is Jesus hanging out with sinners? And you know, in Luke 19.10, Jesus answers that question. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Why was God walking in the garden on that day after the fall? Because he was seeking and he was saving those who were lost. Look at Genesis 3, 9 and 10. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I I hid myself. I love how tender God the Father is with Adam. He asks him a simple question. He doesn't accuse. He doesn't yell. He leaves room for Adam to come clean. Where are you? See, God always pursues sinners. He pursued the first sinners and he continues to pursue us. And what does Adam do? He admits no wrongdoing. I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Not, God, I'm sorry. I did what you told me not to do. I blew it. I thought I knew better than you knew and I took from that fruit. No, it's just, you know, I heard you coming. I'm a... Here's what Hughes writes. It is apparent that at that moment he was more aware of his nakedness and shame than of his sin against God. Adam had undergone a profound change, but all he could do was express his fear and shame. The only thing that Adam truly confessed to was a feeling, was fear. Of course he knew he had broken God's command, but in his new self-focused state, he was more concerned about how he felt than his sin against God. And this self-focus and shrinking from God remains part and parcel to our fallen condition. No one seeks God. Everyone flees from God, according to Romans 3.11. Every fallen man's apparent seeking is not after God, but after an idolatrous God of his own making. Fear and shame and flight are the incurable stigmata of the fall. We only begin to deal with them when God says, where are you? And so God's conversation with Adam continues. Look at verse 11. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Keep in mind that one of the attributes of God is that he's all-knowing. The Lord had seen the entire conversation between the serpent and Eve and Adam take place. God isn't asking out of his ignorance. God isn't asking because he's totally surprised at what's happened with Adam and Eve. He's asking like a gracious parent who's giving the child the chance to fess up on their own. He gave Adam a chance to come clean. And what does Adam do with the opportunity? Look at verse 12. The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. I mean, can't you picture it? God, it's not my fault. She's such a babe. I mean, she's beautiful. She's Eve. She's perfect. She ate the fruit and it's her fault and it's your fault, but it's not my fault. And just two weeks ago, we talked about this beautiful gift of marriage. We talked about the fact that the first time that Adam sees Eve, his response is to break into song. Lord, she is bone of my bones. She is flesh of my flesh, which sounds so weird in English, but is this beautiful Hebrew poem and song that he just breaks out with. It's like early Shakespeare for the Hebrew. I mean, it's beautiful. He knew full well what he was doing when he ate the fruit. He knew that he was guilty. He went from being madly in love with his wife to throwing her under the bus. Wonder how that night went for them, huh? (laughs) Adam, you're sleeping in the other part of the garden tonight. Don't come near me. I'm naked with fig leaves on, all right? Adam desperately tries to shift the blame to his wife. And then to add insult to injury, he shifts the blame to God. He says, it's the woman that you gave me. God, you gave her to me. 
If you hadn't have done this, I would have been fine. In other words, God, if you hadn't have brought Eve, this would have never happened. How many times do we try to shift the blame for our sin? God, if my wife were more affectionate, I'd never look at porn. God, if, if, if my husband were, 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 were a better communicator, I'd never have that inappropriate conversation with the coworker. God, if you'd just given me a brighter mind, I wouldn't have had to cheat. God, if, if I'd only been blessed with more financial resources, then, then I wouldn't have been so jealous. God, if I hadn't had such lousy parents, I'd be a better parent. But, you know, I've just had a terrible parents myself, and so I'm a terrible parent, and that's the way it's going to be. We shift the blame all the time. And I want to say that blame shifting is the default response of a heart that isn't ready for God to do his work of transformation. Listen, if God is going to transform us, we got to stop shifting the blame on other people and own up to our sin. In James chapter 1, 13 to 15, James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote, Let no one, when he is tempted, say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own evil desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings death. There is no good that comes from flirting with sin. In Romans 5.12, the Bible tells us, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through him, death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Last week we said, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us is guilty of sin in our life, your pastor included. The apostle Paul said, I am the chiefest of sinners. I don't know about you, but when I look at my life compared to the post-Christ life of Paul, I feel like if he's the chiefest of sinners, that makes me the chiefest of the chiefest of the chiefest of the chiefest of sinners. Look at the next verse in Genesis 3. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? So Adam shifted blame to her. God looks at her. He plays Adam's game. Okay, what have you done? What is it you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. Just as Adam shifts the blame to Eve, so Eve shifts the blame to the devil. And how many people since that first couple in the garden have said, the devil made me do it. He was just too strong. The temptation was too big. We don't get to blame the devil. James 1, 13 to 15, which I read earlier for you today, forever does away with that excuse. Sin is a powerful enemy. It is an enemy that we have too often embraced. We fall for its allure all the time. And it is because of sin and the effect of sin in our lives that we remember what Jesus did for us on this week so long ago. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the Apostle Paul so eloquently writes what Jesus did for us. God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us. Think about that. God in the flesh is now called sin, and he is sin for us that we who are sinners might become the righteousness of God. That is why we celebrate him this week. Because we don't deserve that. God's grace, his seeking out of sinners, is all over the final week of Christ's life. If you are not someone who on this week, this holy week, is in the habit of reading through the events of that last week of Christ, get the Bible app, look it up, bible.com, pick a reading plan that covers the last week of Christ on earth, and this week you read about that. And here's what you're going to see. All over that last week, you're going to see that our Jesus, our Savior, is somebody who seeks out sinners. He seeks out Zacchaeus. Throughout the week, he meets large crowds of people who turn their back on him by week's end. The crowds that on Palm Sunday shout, Hosanna, by Friday shout, 
crucify him. And at the Last Supper, he blesses the disciples who will betray him, deny him, and curse his name. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he even prays for you and he prays for me. People, we are part of the narrative of Easter. We are part of the narrative of the story of the Passion Week. You're in there. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus prayed for you. And Jesus prayed for me. And he prayed fervently for us, knowing that time and time and time again, we, like the disciples, would betray him and deny him and curse his name. He willingly goes to the cross after patiently enduring the trials. And he lovingly forgives a thief on the cross who in his final hours gives his life to Christ. God made him who had no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So earlier this week, I watched a video that I have watched before. It's a video that some of you have seen in the past. It's a video that rocked my world the first time I saw it. It rocked my world when I watched it again this week. It rocked my world when I watched it again last night. It's going to rock my world when I watch it again here in a few minutes. It's a pastor whose name is Judah Smith. He's a pastor in Seattle, Washington, and he preached a message to his congregation about the trial of Jesus. And you'll recall that on this week, Jesus, who was praised on Palm Sunday, stands before Pilate, and Pilate desperately looks for this opportunity to let Jesus off. And he remembers a custom of the Jews, and that is that at the Passover feast, the governor, in this case Pilate, has the right to release one prisoner. And so he puts Barabbas, this incredibly vile, wicked, scum of the earth prisoner, up in front of the crowd, and he puts Jesus there. And Pilate thinks his Jesus problem is fixed because when he gives the crowd the choice, surely they will release Jesus and keep Barabbas, this murderous man, behind bars where he will be crucified himself for his sin. And the crowd does the unimaginable. They pardon Barabbas. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross and everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. His name's Barabbas. We don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel. And why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, this is about Jesus going to the cross. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This is, this has gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner. A man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. He deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus? What has he done but heal, restore, deliver, set free? Open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper. What what has Jesus done? Who do you want? We want Barabbas. Yeah. Give us Barabbas. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience of Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, for you have set me free. No, I don't see any. 
get at him, Barabbas. And God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent, for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love of the Heavenly Father. When I look at the story, I realize who Barabbas really is. That's me. That's you. That's us. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son for Barabbas, even the one he knew would walk away from Jesus and his free gift and never come back. He loves him. And the nerve, the call, the audacity of believers to think, I got saved by grace, but now that I'm in this deep, dark place of bondage, I'm going to work hard to get myself out. What? That's the opposite of the gospel. Are you bound? Are you held under the power of this temptation, this sin? Do you feel like it's controlling you? What are you going to do? I'm going to shake myself free. Stop it! No, you won't! You're no match for the powers of hell and the urges of sin. You will not overcome it and you will never overcome it. You'll just be another statistic. There's no answer within yourself. Your own merit, your own goodness, your own discipline, your own devotion will not save your marriage and will not save your kids. There's only one. And he's the one that took your place. He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him have Barabbas. Take me. How many times have I stood on that platform with Pilate and Jesus and I'm the Barabbas. And they start to take my chains off. And I say, no, no, I deserve this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the shame. I deserve the consequence. I deserve it. Jesus seems to look at me and say, no, son. Let me have it. Let me have your sin. Let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No! God, I said, I'm so ashamed. Give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh, God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sins, son. This is all we got. It's all I got. It's all you got. We can play games. We can play church games. We can pretend like some people are better than others, and that's why they're blessed. Or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God. And it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believing the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive? Let me have your sin, son. Okay. And I give him my sin. And I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned now. And I feel the love of God saying, go son, live your life. I'll pay the price. Where did we get off thinking that we were going to set ourselves free? 
it's still Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. It'll never stop being the power of Jesus. If His blood is sufficient for your salvation, His blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough. It's hard to watch, isn't it? 